Super. Okay, good morning, uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, I'd like to start by taking this opportunity to thank the organisers for inviting me to speak to you. I'd also like to thank those of you here to, uh, for making the effort for coming so early on the last day, as you've just mentioned. Congratulations to um, our Belgian and to our um, Argentinian friends in the audience, probably more Belgians than Argentinians, and commiserations to the, uh, the Americans and the uh, Swiss. Um, as I walked here from the tube, I was looking at the Eshray posters and the slogan, which is Science Moving People, Moving Science, which I think is a really, whoever came up with that, is a fantastic summary of why we're here, what Eshray stands for, and what we're all trying to do. And I think ultrasound is a perfect example. So it's quite apt that 50 years ago today was the first vaginal transducer, which you can see here. So a, a very simple model. And it wasn't long before things developed quite quickly. And the next year was the first time ultrasound was used to show a fetal heart. Now remember, at this stage, we were using the frog test to identify pregnancies. That's 49 years ago. So next year, the 50th anniversary might be a good, a good um, topic for uh, one of the workshops. And things moved quite quickly after that. We had some ideas which didn't take off. This is one of Alfred Cratterville's suggestions for scanning, which was a, a fingertip micro scanner. Now we have machines that are not that much bigger than an iPod, but we haven't quite got this yet, although we know that we must use the transvaginal dynamically when we assess people. For those local delegates in the audience, this is Hackler. So this is the first person to do follicle tracking. This was up in Glasgow with Ian Donald's unit. And you can see the machine here, how large and cumbersome they were. And uh, you had to get the patient within what was sort of not too dissimilar to CT or MRI in terms of its, its size and its inconvenience. 1979. So again, not that long, 10 years old, we just go back, and you can see here, still fantastic pictures of the follicle developing. You can see this was thought to be the cumulus oophorus, which we know isn't, uh, isn't visible really now, but uh, a bit of artifact. But what's fantastic is looking at these diameters and the correlations of the Easter dial that went up on such limited images. Things moved fairly quickly thereafter, so um, five years later we had the first trans-abdominal aspiration follicles. It was trans if you remember, and then eventually became trans by Dallenbach in 1988. That is really very recent. And we can see here follicle, PCO, and a corpus luteum. PCO certainly moved on from then, but it's still a bit of an enigmatic area. These images were static, these were B-mode, so you took the image, whereas now we're just used to doing dynamic scanning, we take it for granted that we can uh, assess people. But transvaginal real-time scanning wasn't until 1985. And after that, things moved more quickly, 3D, 4D, and now we have HD line. And I'm going to talk to you about automation. So this is a, uh, I wouldn't say a standard scan, I don't know why I picked this one, because clearly this lady is uh, very well stimulated, if not overstimulated. But it's a good example of what we have to do every day in the unit. So we have to measure these follicles. I don't think it takes very much to say it's going to be tricky to even count the total number of follicles, let alone get accurate measures of each dimension of these follicles. But we do this on a daily basis, and we assume that we're correct and we're making reliable measures. And why do we do that? Well, actually there's very little in the literature. What is there is, again, back into the late 80s and early 90s. So if we look at these studies, these are probably the five key studies that I could identify of why we do follicle tracking and what we're looking for. We know that we'll get a mature oocyte from most follicles that are 14 to 16 millimetres on, and there becomes a limit where if you leave follicles too long, either we'll have ovulation or there will be problems with uh, post-maturity and follicles become atretic. But in many cases, and certainly our experience in our unit is we'll get a mature egg from about 10 to 12 millimetres. And this is one of our KPIs when we're looking at egg collections. So we've got a good measure of how accurate our follicle scanning is by the number of mature or the number of oocytes that we obtain. And we're looking for the key figures of final follicular maturation of around one to three follicles, depending on what we're trying to aim for, of 17 to 18 millimetres. So this is standard practice across the world, but actually if we go back to the real basic science, there's still not a great deal of, of papers in large numbers of patients, and something we maybe should think about. In terms of when we actually time, there are, again, a limited number of randomised controlled trials looking at modifying the final flip, final flip for maturation, HCG or LH or agonist trigger, and then the, the effect thereafter. 
We've got three studies that show if you wait, if you delay the HCG trigger deliberately, you have a reduction in fertilization pregnancy rates. No data on live birth. We have one study with Dimitri that said it was beneficial to wait for 24 hours, and the study by SL Tan's group showed there was no difference. So clearly not an uh, uh, agreement there, but again, something we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, if we look at those figures overall, the question is, do we need to actually measure follicles that precisely? In the context of multi follicular stimulation, so of course if we're looking at natural cycle, ovulation induction, or insemination, where we've got one solitary follicle, mono follicular um, development, then it's probably going to be more important, but in the context of multiple follicles, we need to measure them that accurately. Or is it because the measurements that we're applying are not that accurate, do they vary very much? Or potentially are they inaccurate measurements? So I'm going to try and explore those uh, concepts with you. So if I asked you what happens in your unit, so I, I spoke to quite a few people last night, some people scan, some people don't scan, but what you need to know is how the person scanning the unit is scanning. And this is a very true um, uh, example of what happens in our unit. So we have people that measure follicles differently. Some people measure a single, some people take two measures, some people take two and then rotate the probe to 90 degrees to get that third plane and some people do a best guess. And we know all of these happen. And that's, have to scroll through the ovary and measure all of the follicles uh, subsequently. And you can see here a very quick analysis. We've got a seven millimeter difference here. And this is me measuring these in the context of preparing a slide for a conference. So seven millimeters for very, very simple measurements. And clearly that's not acceptable. What about 3D? So, for those you're not familiar with 3D, you acquire a two-dimensional uh, data set, which is a series of two-dimensional images. You've then got these three planes, and the beauty here is we can put the dot in the center of the follicle. So you can use it just to standardize your view. So you don't have to do anything fancy with 3D, other than just use the spatial awareness that you're getting to make sure you're in the center of the follicle. So when you're making those measurements, the three perpendicular, the X, Y, and the Z measure, you know that you're exactly in the right, time, uh, right uh, point. And when you rotate through 90 degrees, you're not moving the probe, you're pressing the button, so you've got an automatic 90 degree rotation. If you do this, you end up with smaller measures. So if you do a single measure, you tend to have a larger estimate. When you take a second measure, then a third measure, and then use 3D, the size of the follicle gets slowly lower and lower. So again, it's really important that you know who's measuring your follicles and how they're measuring them. Because technique will change. Now, the next step is automated follicle measurements. So here what we've had to do is we require a data set. Very simple, takes about 20 to 30 seconds, and we've got the whole ovarian volume. So this is our standard plane that we would see, the longitudinal plane, transverse, but we've got this extra coronal plane. So this is the plane that's at 90 degrees to the transducer base. And then if we apply Sono ABC, which is the software that we use, and this is from six, seven years ago when the software first developed, we can see that it actually identifies all of the hyperechoic black areas. So each of these is called a voxel. A voxel is a volume element or a three-dimensional pixel. So it picks up the volumes very clearly. It'll pick up some which uh, are artifactual, and I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. And I'll come back to these measures. So it identifies the follicles. In most cases, 100% of the follicles. And you've got a size and a volume of each of these follicles. And you can scroll through the data set to check that you've missed or that you've not missed a follicle and that you've identified all the follicles correctly. And there are other things you can do. So you can edit this. There's an edit mode where you can merge follicles. So if the software has said there are two separate follicles but there's one, you can join them together. If there's two follicles that have identified separately but it's actually, um, sorry, if there's two uh, follicles within one that's been identified, you can split them and separate them. And this is what we call post processing. Now, I think this is the biggest problem with the software, is that when we got it, and when people try it, everyone presses the button and they expect to see a measured ovary, perfectly measured, with no artifact, straightforward. And my take home message is that's not gonna happen. And that's not gonna happen even with the best images. So you're gonna do this, you're gonna have to take some time to do some processing. And I'm gonna think that's probably the key reason why it's not taken off. So let's look at the measurements first of all. So we have these uh, measures that are automated here, and they'll appear automatically on your system. And if you have a, a patch system, it will go straight to your, um, to your records. So we've got three measures. V, which is the volume. Now the volume is actually a true three-dimensional measurement. So it's made up of these three-dimensional pixels. So it's not calculated, it's actually physically measured within the data set. It's a volumetric measurement. 
So there's no formulae here. If you take the volume of a, a follicle, and you can see here, follicles are not spherical. We measure the diameter of a follicle every day, but follicles don't have a diameter. It, it's very rare, apart from maybe monofollicular ovulation, that we'll see a, a spherical follicle. They're more usually pyramidal or rhomboid in shape. So we're forcing a measure, a, a diameter, on an object that doesn't actually have a diameter. So again, there's a little bit of, of an area there. So the best thing is actually to measure the volume of the follicle. And that's the future, I think. We need to be looking at volume, not linear measurements. The relaxed sphere diameter, if we take one of these follicles that isn't spherical, and you imagine it forms a ball, so it becomes a perfect sphere. If you then measure that diameter, that's called the relaxed sphere diameter. So these are true volumetric measurements, the volume and then the diameter derived from the volume. And these are the measures that I think we're going to need to use. When the software was developed, we helped with this, and we asked for the X, Y, and Z diameters. So this is the largest diameter, and then the two perpendicular diameters. We wanted these measures because we wanted people to be able to look and compare to what they're doing in their standard practice. And you have an average of these three measures called the MD. I want you to remember these two figures. So the relaxed sphere diameter, the true 3D diameter, and then the MD, which is these X, Y, and Z diameters. So just using the spatial orientation. You'll see why these are important later. So one of the chaps I spoke to last night over dinner, he said, again, I tried the software and it just, it, it just throws up funny colours, I, I give up. And I think that's true of 90% of people. This is the typical problem that we see. So we can see here there's a large piece of artefact. We call this bleeding. It's, what it's done is recognised a vessel or maybe a cyst, or in many cases, as here, just artefacts. We've got some bowel, we've got some, some abnormal echoes. Now what you've got to do is you've got to find the area where there's a, a break, there's a little break there, and you draw around the follicle, it identifies it automatically again, and then you just get rid of the abnormal data. So it is actually easy to do, you just need to invest some time to do it. But the best way to do this, and to make it much easier, is you just ignore the follicle. You just delete it, and then measure it manually. Now, if you do that, you'll end up having to measure two or three follicles. So you still have the measures of all the rest automatically, but instead of having to scroll through that ovary, count the follicle, make sure you don't measure it twice, make sure you don't miss it. With this, you're going to be limiting yourself to maybe only two or three measures. So it's quicker and it's more accurate, as I'll now show. And that was, that was then, this is now. So the software's gone through, I think, 11 or 13 iterations, so it's improving all the time. And it's important to remember this software is learning as we go along. So the more we do, it will improve its, its identification of the follicle. So let's have a look at some science now behind this. So when we first had the software, we wanted to know, is, is it accurate? Did it actually measure follicular diameter or follicular volume correctly? So we did a very, very simple study. We aspirated follicles. We took consideration of the dead space of the needle within the tube, and we used the measured volume to the nearest uh, one millimeter, nearest point one millimeter, uh, and equated that with what we were measuring on, on scan. So that's the summary table. And I'm going to show you the raw data, which is it, it's a bit of a scary slide, but I'm going to make it really easy for you. So, first of all, if we look at these three columns, this is the true volume. So this is when we aspirated the follicular fluid. So we can see we've got a range of volumes from, well, we tried to get a volume to equate to the diameters that we want to measure. So 11 up to 22. So we measured the volume, the fluid in the follicle, and we worked out what the diameter of the follicle should have been. That's this true measure here. And then you can look at the measurement through the relaxed sphere, the automated 3D measurement. And you can see, in every single case, it's pretty much spot on. The more important figure to look at isn't the main figure, but it's the one underneath, the confidence interval, or the range rather. And you can see that we're within one millimeter here in all cases. So 14 is 13.5 to 14.2. So we've got a very, very narrow range. When we look at other techniques, so we've got here manual measurements with 2D, so one measure, two measures, then we started using 3D. You can see if we take 18 millimeters as an example, it's not bad, 18, 19, 17. It's quite consistent, but what you've got to look at is this range. When we're using the automated software, it's within one, maybe one and a half millimeters. When we look at the uh, manual measures in 2D and 3D, we've got ranges of up to five millimeters. Five millimeters, we're trying to get that 17 to 18 mil follicle. So this is really broad, and this is in the context of a research program by people who are measuring it very, very carefully. So I presume in real life it's going to be even more broad. And people always ask me, if you're going to move to volume, what should you be looking for? Well, here's your answer. 
Between 16 and 22 mil follicle, you're looking at about around to 2.5 cubic centimetres up to about 5. So you can see from a measure of 16 to 22, very short, we've only got 7 millimetres there, but with a volume 2.5 to 5.5. So we've actually got more information which we can glean from if we look at volume than diameter. And that's something that I think we, we do need to do. So we then went on, accepted that these measures are accurate and they're reliable to see if they improved our clinical workflow. So we did a very simple uh, test which was, did these follicles, did the software pick up as many follicles as our expert sonographer? And what I haven't said in most of our publications is the person doing this scan was a very, very experienced sonographer who worked for years and she'd done probably more follicle trackings than anybody else. So she was a pretty good gold standard to, to, uh, to compare against. And we can see here, in terms of the number of follicles, it's identical. So 2D is pretty good at getting the number right and based on size. So there was no difference there. But in terms of time, it was very clear that it was much faster. So with Sonar ABC, you can scan the patient, acquire a volume and they can leave. Now, we all need to interact with patients, of course, so we have to consider how we do this. But from a patient's perspective, they can be in, have a scan and go to work quickly. You could then train a technician to do the measurements, which is something we're looking at. And technicians generally tend to measure better than often than we do in a busy clinical situation. And that was uh, something a lot of the people I spoke to last night agreed with. So 3D overall was quicker. 2D wasn't too slow, but it was, it was certainly quick and it's consistent. The time taken to acquire a volume and measure it automatically doesn't really change. Whereas the time for a manual measurement will vary depending on the skill of the sonographer and the number of follicles. So you can pretty much plan and know what to do. So the measurements are faster, they're more valid, accurate, they're more reliable, reproducible. So the next question is, did they make a difference to our clinical practice? So we got very excited, we did a randomised controlled trial. This was powered for mature view sites. I won't go into the details of the, of the studies published. So it was a, a, a 74 patients, 72, which seems low, but it's adequately powered for maturity. Not, not pregnancy, not live birth. This is the baseline data, so the groups having uh, follicular, um, having their final follicular maturation and their egg collection based on standard 2D measures against using the automated system. So they were similar at baseline. And this is one of the most disappointing data sets I ever saw, no difference at all in outcome. So we ended up with the same number of follicles, the same number of eggs, the same number of fertilised eggs, mature eggs, embryos. So this fantastically wonderful software that was brilliant didn't make a difference to our outcome. Very disappointing. Now, part of that, I think, I accept it may be no difference at all, but part of it, if I remind you, is this was being done by a very expert scanner. So, again, maybe if we compared this to somebody who uh, wasn't so familiar with scanning, it, we'd see different results. But ultimately, that's not acceptable. If your scanning is not up to scratch, you shouldn't be scanning. So I think she's, again, still a good scanner. We've gone on, and we've now doubled the size. We're not quite looking at uh, pregnancy yet but we've improved the, uh, the uh, number up to 164. And we are starting to see a difference. And you can see here, mature oocytes, not significant, and I don't believe in quoting trends, but you can see it's pretty close. But we are getting roughly one more fertilized oocyte with the automated measures, which ends up with one more cleavage stage embryo. And I'm sure you're sitting there thinking, one more fertilized egg, one more embryo. Probably not a big deal. But I choose to have that over one less. And clinical pregnancy, we're not powered for this, but no difference, ultimately. So maybe we're starting to see the timing could affect our maturity, which, of course, is going to be beneficial, but still no obvious long-term um, outcome for clinical data. So it's all promising. It looks very nice. It measures accurately. You can be quicker. One of the key issues, then, is why is it not working? And this is something that we haven't published yet. So this is something, if you, if you want to go away and start using this, this is probably the most important take-home message. So we did uh, some animal work, we went to the abattoir and we took some ovaries for some cats. We had a, a large selection of different sized follicles and they were dissected out. So 32 ovaries with lots and lots of follicles. We've repeated this now to outer follicles as well. And what we found, when we measured the size, we can dissect the follicle out, we can keep it intact and we can actually accurately measure it. Um, you can measure its volume, you can measure its diameter. These are the correlation graphs. So remember, this is the relaxed sphere and this is the X, Y, and Z diameter. And they look like they correlate. But if you look at these graphs underneath, which are more important, these are the limits of agreement. 
the dots around the line are how variable the data are, how spread they are. And what you want is you want them to group narrowly around the central black line. The zero is no difference. So our automated measures are the same as our dissected animal, our real measures. Not only are they variable, but what you'll see is they're all above the line. So we're seeing a consistent difference here between the software and what we're measuring in real life. And what we found, and to make it easy to understand, is there's a shift. Our red line here is our true dissection diameter. And when we used the software, we saw a shift. So the software is under-measuring the follicles. Why we managed to get such accurate results when we did the aspiration, I don't know. But in the uh, in vitro setting, we are um, coming up short. More so with the relaxed diameter than the X, Y, and Z diameter. So just coming back to that to explain it. The MD, which is the average of the X, Y, and Z, just standard linear measurements, is larger than the relaxed sphere diameter in all cases. So what we're seeing here is actually if we use this diameter rather than the relaxed sphere diameter, we're getting closer to the true measurement follicle. What's important, if you look back at that graph, is there's a consistent difference. So if you're going to start using the software, what you'll notice is your 18 mil follicles are going to become 16 and a half mil follicles. That's got important implications for your practice. If they're smaller, if they're about 10 or 11, there'll only be a smaller difference because this is proportional to the size of the follicle. So even though when you see the picture it looks perfect, it is just a little bit under. So if you start using it, it's going to be smaller, so make sure you account for that in your measurements. It's systematic, so you can, and this is what we're doing now, develop a figure to correct. So it will fit in with what we use to measure it, or you just accept the measurements and you modify your, your final fluky tracking. You probably didn't see it, but if you look at our studies, our randomised trials, what we're tending to do with Sono ABC is we're tending to have one extra day of stimulation because we were under measuring. And I'm not sure whether that leads to the benefit. If you remember those five papers I showed you at the start, three said there was a beneficial effect of delaying HCG. So maybe what we've seen here is an artificial improvement in maturity and fertilization because we're under measuring the follicle. What about andro follicles? So when we looked at these larger follicles, everything about 10 millimeters was picked up by the software. It was all measured. It was measured, as you can see, it was slightly under measured, but it identified every follicle. So we then started to look at the small follicles, the andro follicles, which were much difficult to do, and this is not what the software was designed to. The software has actually been programmed and developed on larger follicles, so it hasn't been tested on smaller follicles in the laboratory. So if we take the same volume, we acquire a volume of an ovary, but a pre-stimulated ovary, so a baseline scan. What you do is the same thing. You literally just put your uh, volume within, a date, within the uh, object of interest, activate the software. And you can see immediately it's missed at least half of the follicles. So when you look at follicles less than 10 millimeters, it will miss 50%. So you're going to have to do this post-processing again. Now with larger follicles, you tend to have to draw around them and identify them as separate or the same follicle. When you look at andro follicles, all you have to do is click on them and identify them. So it's a very different type of work that you need to do, but you certainly need to do it. Now these follicles aren't accurate. You can see here, you know, this isn't a truly shaped follicle. But don't worry about the sizes. If you just use this software, you can use it to just make sure you're counting the right number of andro follicles. So very easy to do. You know that you've not counted the follicle twice because every single colour is different. So you can't identify two green follicles, two red ones and you can scroll through the data set until you're happy that you've measured all of them. Now, we've got the same measurements, and we can see here we'll have the diameters, uh, remembering that they're going to measure slightly smaller again, but probably less so with follicles that are small, because proportionally it won't be such, a, such an error. You've seen these graphs. These are the, the uh, um, logistic, uh, the uh, limits of agreement graphs. And what we did here, this is 2D measures, this is 3D, and now we're looking at Sono ABC. And remember, the closer you are to that central black line, the more repeatable the measure are. And we looked at this with one observer, and we looked at this with multiple observers, and you can see it's pretty consistent. And as we move from 2D to 3D to automated measures, we're getting pretty close now. I'm sure we've got some AMH people in the audience, and we know how accurate AMH is, or it's going to be once the new platform's out. If you use automated ultrasound follicles, you're within two follicles. It doesn't matter if you've only got 10, or you've got 40. So we're getting to the stage with automated ultrasound that we're, we can consider it, consider it a bit more like a biological assay or a biochemical assay. So again, it's a really good technique. 
So does it change outcomes? So if we look at follicles, we know that small follicles are the key ones. So again, if we measure these and then look at outcome, so anti-follicle counts that are automated and uh, controlled for the size of the follicles, does this improve things? So, very simple, first of all we compare pregnant to non-pregnant, it's not a good way to do statistics and you just have to take it with a pinch of salt, but it's always important when you see significant differences. And I want to draw your attention just to the differences in these two groups, so the pregnant and non-pregnant, in follicle size. And you can see that overall, the patients that were pregnant had a higher total anthropological count. It was 19, almost 20 versus 14. But what's more interesting is if you look at the cohort size, it's only these smaller follicles, 2 to 4 millimetres, that were significantly different. The 4 to 6, 6 to 8, 8 to 9, no difference at all. So, okay, forget statistics, just look at that. The follicles above 4 or 5 millimetres, they were completely the same. It's a significant difference here, 7 versus 4. So, the overall total anthropologic count is different because of the smaller follicles. Now, 2 to 4, remember, we're going to have a bit of an error here, as I've just shown you. So, 2 to 4 probably is 2 to 5 based on the animal work that, that uh, we've just discussed. There's lots in the literature at the moment that new ultrasound machines identified all these follicles that we never saw before. It's sort of true. If you actually look at the pulse frequency of machines that were available 10 years ago, they were still able to identify one millimeter follicles. In our experience, the vast majority of small follicles are not less than one. Most of them are around one to five millimeters. So it's actually still quite consistent. So it's a good tool for picking them up. If we then look at some linear analysis to outcomes of mature fertilized uh, oocytes and then the number of cleaved uh, um, embryos, we've got exactly the same outcome. So total follicle number related to these three outcome variables, but only the small follicles of two to four. And again, look at the other ones, four to six, six to eight, there's no differences in most of these here. But a consistent, significant higher number of small follicles when you have more mature eggs, more fertilized eggs, and more cleaved embryos. So these smaller ones, which we've known for a while, are key, and we've now got the ability to, to measure them. Logistic regression, again, we can see here, if we look at pregnancy, we've got a link here between the smaller follicles and pregnancy rates. But before we get too excited, unfortunately, the rock curve's not climbing up as high as we'd like it to. So it's roughly just above, I think it's about 0.64. So it's above the 0.5 to 0.6 where we just say it's tossing a coin. But we're far from having a test that's going to tell us about um, uh, pregnancy and life, but I know there's lots of discussions about this at A&H, but we're getting better if we measure these small follicles. So you all know that, and we know that, but the question is why? <coughs> and the reason why is comes back to A&H and its follicle quality. So if you look at these uh, um, fantastic work by Wien in here, and you look at the staining for A&H, the next slide's more uh, important. I think a lot of people make this mistake. It's about it's the size of the follicles, the smaller follicles, express more AMH. As we get larger, as we get towards the six millimeters, the expression of AMH drops. If you look at older women, women with low AMHs and with um, high FSHs, they tend to get these larger follicles, the follicles of six to 10, up to 12 millimeters. There's some disorder of follicular genesis. So it's these small follicles, these follicles of roughly one millimeter onwards, up to about four to five, that are influenceable by FSH, that are the key. So if we look at small follicles, to some degree, we're looking at AMH as well. But remember, AMH is also produced by those smaller follicles that are probably going to be harder to influence in the IVF context. And the key thing that everyone asks about, the great thing about AMH, of course, is you can measure any day of the cycle, no problem, but your follicles, they're, they're all over the place. It's not true. This has been shown many occasions. If you look at the whole follicle population, it varies, no doubt about that. But it's because of the larger follicles. It's because we're follicles are growing, dominant follicle develops, but other follicles grow and then become matrectic. If you look at the smaller follicles that we're talking about here, 2 to 6, 17, 17, 17, 18, no significant difference. AMH, there's a significant increase in the luteal phase in our work. But just to show you a very precisely, easier picture to, uh, to see, total follicle count will vary because of the larger follicles here. But if you look at these smaller follicles, they're consistent. So if you want to do an anthropological count with 2D, with 3D, with automated, as long as you measure those smaller follicles, 2 to 5, 2 to 6s, which are the ones we need to measure anyway, you can measure them at any time of the cycle. So to summarise, so ultrasound certainly moved on. Uh, as I said, this, the slogan, science moving people, moving science, it really is true. I think ultrasound is a, it's a fantastic example of how we've used um, 
the, the work relationship between industry and applying it clinically, and it's going to change even more, I think. And as you said at the start, we use ultrasound on a daily basis for monitoring, for pre-treatment assessment, follicle collection, transfers, early pregnancy. So it's, it's a shame, I think, ultrasound doesn't get a, a bigger platform. Uh, we know that 3D is more reliable and valid, and that's not just uh, follicles, but in all cases. Sorry, ABC, it will identify all your follicles above 10 millimeters, all of them. You need, they need to do some uh, um, processing if you want to measure them and individually uh, size them. It will also pick up the smaller follicles, but remember it will miss more of those, so there's a different form of post-processing to pick them up. It's the smaller follicles that are the key, these are the ones that seem to relate more to quality, the follicles that will influence, it will probably give us more information, not the total, but more information about uh, a pregnancy if we're ever going to get towards live birth data. And follicles, if you measure the right ones, are stable through the cycle. And there's huge research opportunities and potential here that we can all explore. Thank you very much.